Okay, well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. Um, Steve was giving directions as to, you know, using the hand raise uh, signal there. So the blue hand would show up um, after I finished my remarks. Well, I think this morning, I'm gonna just jump right to that opportunity for you. It's been quite a, a week this past week and, uh, uh, and things have shifted in, in uh, some rather significant ways, I think. And uh, perhaps you have uh, some things on your mind that maybe you'd like to bring up or ask questions about or talk about um, in regards to um, what's taking place uh, now these days um, and, and how that might relate to our practice and the, and the teachings uh, here. So if, uh, if you have any uh, questions uh, along those lines, uh, anything you'd like to bring up, um, here's your opportunity. If, uh, if no one does, then I have, uh, I have a question for you, <laughs> but, uh, which I might bring up sooner or later anyway. But I see uh, now we have Bill uh, has a question. So Bill, if you wanna take that, you have to unmute yourself. There we go. Thank you. Um, hi, Steve. Uh, I have a lot of things I'd like to talk to you about, having uh, gone into your book, but I'd, le I'd like to go back to, uh, I think it was the last time you talked, and you talked about uh, walking around the lake and uh, the uh, uh, geese that were there and the uh, dog that went through and how the geese reacted. And then another time you were walking around, maybe the next day, and uh, the geese were there and a cat walked through and uh, how the geese reacted to that. And then you had uh, a comment on that. And that uh, brought up uh, uh, to my mind, I just wanna ask you, what is, maybe it has nothing to do with this, but what is your, uh, how do you deal with, what is your take on, and can you talk a little bit about coincidences? Um, yeah, could you just say, uh, how are you relating coincidences? Do you, are you suggesting that it, it's just a coincidence that the geese reacted this way, they parted when the dog came, they all kind of scattered, they started squawking and scattering. And when the cat came through, uh, there was no reaction whatsoever among them. They just kept on eating the grass as, as they had been doing. The cat walked right among them. Uh, so are you are you asking is is this just a coincidence? Do you think? Because uh, I've, I actually have seen this uh, more than once. So ah uh, okay, uh, especially with uh, the dogs, it's always the reaction with the dogs. Yeah. Um, now I think what the coincidence is your presence that was there at that time, that place in the lake. Um, I'm still not quite following. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, I was there. And you it saw was coincident you saw, with the <laughs> yeah. You saw the event. You saw the cat, or uh, you saw the cat and the dog. Mm -hmm. Go through the geese, yeah, and uh, <clears throat> the uh, coincidence I'm implying is that you were walking along there and you saw those two events, at yeah, mm -hmm. times. and you, your presence there is the uh, coincidence, uh, your observation. Well, it's just by coincidence, I was there, yeah. Well, yes, but as I said, I've been, I've seen this repeatedly, but the other thing was that I wasn't up to the flock of the geese yet. I saw it from, you know, a little distance off. So I, uh, and the geese really don't react to me with, without a dog. Uh, uh, the, the dog that I saw in the incident that I recorded or that I mentioned was uh, uh, on a leash uh, by a little old lady who had this little dog on a leash. <laughs> and uh, as, the, as they were approaching from the other side uh, of the flock that was stretched out across the path there, uh, immediately the, I could, the necks were going up on the geese they were hon and they started honking little hoots kind of sort of like a warning honk I would imagine uh, to the other geese and pretty soon they were all um, had their necks up and they started walking away parting on either side of the path just 
Mm -hmm. I said it was like uh, Moses parting the waters, you know, which is, <laughs> and, uh, and I've seen this more than once. Uh -huh. um, and the fact that I was there, but I wasn't, I wasn't among the geese yet myself. Yeah. When I walk along, I come to the flock of geese and there's nobody else there or no dog or whatever. Uh, they don't part that much, you know, a little bit maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can just kind of walk through, but they're, they're not alarmed by me or anything. They, 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 a few of the adults there, they usually have some young among them and uh, they'll, there'll be one or two that have their necks up. They're kind of just eyeing me, mm -hmm. but uh, they aren't sounding any alarm or anything. And I don't make any mm -hmm. you know, aggressive gestures, mm -hmm. you know, um, but like in the case of the cat, of course the cat's a lot smaller than I am, but um, they didn't react at all, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> and, and, but the point I was making there was that um, here you have geese with, you know, their little bird brain. <laughs> I imagine maybe the size of a walnut or thereabouts who instantly <clears throat> could spot the difference between a dog and a cat. Mm -hmm. And I was talking about, you know, our kind of our infatuation with artificial intelligence and this sort of thing. And we're trying to see if we can come up with, with a conscious machine and mm -hmm. stuff like this. Uh, and, uh, and then we keep likening our own brains and minds uh, to those of computers and stuff like this. When it is obvious that uh, whatever's going on in, in the mind of a, of a human or a bird or any other uh, sentient creature. Uh, it is not at all like what is going on in a computer. Mm -hmm. and, um, and and I, I make more of a case for that in the book that I just uh, uh, you know, finished. But that that to me was just abundantly clear at that time. And even then that was some, so that was back in the 80s uh, when I was writing my first book. And um, when I made that observation, but since, I mean, I've seen it repeated many, many times. And uh, it's always the same. And, um, uh, and over these last 30, 40 years, um, they've made all kinds of strides, uh, strides in making more powerful and faster computers and all of this. Um, at that time, I think the, the speeds were at about 10 billion uh, uh, calculations or, or, you know, connections per second in, a, in their supercomputers. Today, I think they're in the trillions. Mm -hmm. And still, uh, they, they have yet to make a, a computer that can instantly recognize the dif difference between a dog and a cat. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what they're doing there is comparing all sorts of things from their memory banks and this kind of stuff and just you know checking all this kind of stuff up and they still can't do it. I mean, and even if they get to a point where, yeah, no, boy, we, we seem like we have a computer here that can actually make that distinction. But it's the point I'm making, it, it is obvious <laughs> what we have here. And even birds have it with their little bird brains. And uh, I would say creatures much smaller than birds have uh, this ability to draw these kinds of distinctions. But it's not even that we have it because uh, what's going on here uh, has nothing to do with our brains and even our bodies. And it isn't like consciousness is housed within, within a, you know, a, a body of some sort of, you know, um, it, it, something else altogether is taking place. Uh, but all I'm doing with that anal analysis there uh, of this observation that, uh, that I was making there is that it seems to me that it should be directly obvious that there's a clear distinction between what's going on within a conscious mind and what's going on in a computer. I just use that as one example. And that's all there is, you know, <laughs> to it. And that's the only point I was making. Mm -hmm. um... I don't want to occupy too much of this, but I, I think uh, what I was trying to get at is what is your take on coincidences in general in life? Well, you mean like remarkable things that happen? Yeah, like the story, what was it? Uh, oh, I forget. Uh, oh, Arthur Kessler. <laughs> I went through an Arthur Kessler uh, phase some many many years ago now, but he wrote a book. Well, I think it was, it was the uh, uh, I forget, but he, I, I forget the name of the book. But but he had a a chapter in there on coincidences, and I remember he gave a case of a fellow who 
what was it? He he lost his cufflinks. He was in a uh, staying in a hotel in Paris or something like this, and uh, forgot his cufflinks or left them in a drawer there in the in his room or whatever. And then a couple of years later, uh, he finds them in a in a he's, he's in Toronto and he's staying yeah. in a hotel. And he opens a drawer and there's his cufflinks, something like that. And uh, so he was he cited examples of extreme coincidences where you just wouldn't expect such a thing to occur. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but then that's just it. I mean, you know, the, the, those kinds of things are very infrequent, uh, but they, yeah, they occur. Um, you want to know what I make of that? I don't make anything of it. I don't know what oh. to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't put any special attachment to it or any kind of sig or significance to that, uh, mm. nor would I say, well, no, you know, because mm. I don't know. Mm. Um, and, and I don't think uh, any of us do. Uh, that's not the sort of thing we can have knowledge about. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's why. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we can we can run we can run the statistical analysis and and the uh, uh, what's the word I want, but um, uh, and and all those kinds of things and, and uh, you know the odds run the you know the odds and all this sort of thing. And uh, most of the time, these coincidences, even when they're fairly extreme, like that particular one, if I if I remember that one correctly, but it was something rather remarkable like that. <laughs> and he had several of those. But uh, and, they, and the more remarkable they seem to be, the more rare they are. But also, when you calculate this uh, statistically, what's the odds of this happening? Uh, the numbers uh, get smaller and smaller uh, as to you know how likely would it be, yeah. and. Uh, and that all, all all fits together. That all seems to make sense, you know. <laughs> uh, does it ever get to a point where it would just be zero? This could never possibly happen. Yeah. Well, I suppose if, you know, uh, probably are some uh, you know, things like that. Now, if something like that were to happen, then I, I suppose what well, we'd we'd have to call it a miracle or something. But I don't know <laughs> that we have any evidence of such things as that. If we do, I'd love to hear about it. If any of you know of such a thing, I'd like to know about that. But I, I wouldn't make any, any anything uh, of that. Mm -hmm. This is all the kind of mechanical workings of of the uh, conceptual world, uh, mm -hmm. the the world that is constructed, you know, not just in our minds, but it's actually just it's constructed in just this very way by mind itself, and uh, uh, has nothing to do with your mind or my mind. And all of these things can be analyzed mathematically and all of that. And there's nothing particularly remarkable about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and though there are some extremely rare and strange coincidences, that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And that's, that's a far cry from suddenly waking into what our direct perceptual experience is, which is what awakening is. Yeah. And it has nothing to do with what those kinds of... Uh, analyses are things that can go on within the conceptual alone, which is where all these coincidences lie. Paradoxes uh, are there, uh, contradictions are there, all, all, all of that sort of thing. That's where we find that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and for most of us, this is all we're tuned into is the conceptual. Mm -hmm. And uh, for us, that's the max, uh, maximum of REM, that's the totality of reality. Uh, but it isn't, and we can wake up to this and realize that it's not, and there's something else altogether that's taking place. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with actually understanding what mind is. We're not going to calculate our way there, build computers and things like that to get us there, as if there's something else at work here altogether. And we can know what that is. We can wake up to what that is, and whereas this is not mysterious, we can actually see directly mm -hmm. um, you know, what it is. Mm -hmm. And I think I can safely say um, that uh, there's no way we're going to get there uh, through the constructed world you know, of, of our minds in the way that we um, interpret everything in the mind as things and stuff like this. Yeah. Right. Right. Very good. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, we have a few more here now. Uh, Mike, I guess they're in the order that they show up here. So uh, Mike's the next on the list. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Yeah, you give me the nod there. So Mike? Yeah, okay, Steve. Yeah, this, yeah, hi. this uh, concerns uh, the election. Um, 
you know, despite one side being declared the winter winner and all the self congratulations that are going on, it does seem that there's still a lot of uncertainty. There's legal challenges. There's the fact that legislatures could appoint their own slate of electors when the electoral college meets on December 14th. And I'm just wondering um, how, how best to deal with the uncertainty so uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't dwell dwell on that at all, Mike. Uh, I'm aware of these things too, and the fact that the electoral college hasn't met yet, and there's a lot of things that could happen there. And um, uh, they don't talk about this like in the news and stuff like this, but, but it's it, there's such things as that are there. Um, but I, I think we can just let this unfold as, as it will, and uh, I don't know what you're going to do about that at this point. No. But there's, there's very little, if anything, you can do about any, any of that. But what you can do is watch your mind and you can remain sane and calm and settled. And even if uh, things uh, go in a direction that, that bother you or you don't like, you can still uh, uh, yeah, take care of your mind. And, uh, and that's what this way is. That's what this practice is. It isn't about fretting and worrying about uh, the uh, the what ifs of the world that might come, you know, flying our way. Okay. Uh, that doesn't really really help very much. And also, the even if um, things do work in a bad way for us, at some time at least it seems that way. Uh, we can also remember it's a Taoist teaching, but that is of the of the Chinese farmer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just realizes and this if you settle with this and look at it enough you start to realize yeah how can you say that this is uh bad necessarily it might be bad for this situation seemingly and that's right but this situation doesn't end at some arbitrary boundary here within the uh the context of, of the whole and totality i wouldn't worry about these things that's all being uh what can I say? There's nothing really to say about it, but these things are, um, they're not something that, that we have to spend a lot of time with. Okay. In fact, I wouldn't spend really any time uh, with that. But uh, of course, if that's where you are, but just try to re you know remember this, just see, bring yourself back to this immediate reality that you're in now. And as far as those kinds of worries and concern, you're, you know, you're not dealing with that right now. Were those things to occur and the whole world uh, starts to unravel right before your eyes and all of that, uh, you can still, there is a way to live that is totally sane and, uh, and not be uh, caught up by, by all of that. And that's what this way is here. It is not about bringing about miraculous uh, turns and different events and getting things to go in a way that I think would be good. And that's right. Don't even, the, the awakened don't even look at the unfolding of the world in this way. Inter interpreting it in terms of good or bad or which way I'd like it to go. Mm -hmm. In fact, that was going to be my question. If none of you had a question, I, my question was going to be, well, how would the awakened, how would a Buddha uh, govern? And um, I'll give you the short answer right now. They, a, a Buddha wouldn't govern. Um, they don't concern themselves uh, with with, uh, with things of this nature. Hmm. So, it, I, no, I, I should make this clear too because it might sound like you could interpret what I'm just saying now is that well, just never mind, don't worry about it, and. and tune out and, and uh, just be calm and all that. I'm not saying that at all. You know, uh, an awakened one is living with full awareness of what's taking place. So this isn't about putting blinders on or, or, or uh, uh, putting on the rose colored glasses and that kind of stuff. It's nothing like that at all. This is about facing directly what is actually unfolding here. Uh, but if we do, we don't have to do this with a lot of anxiety and fear and worrying about the what ifs. Mm -hmm. And it isn't keeping in mind, yeah, the possibilities of this or that might happen. You know, but, but that's not now. That's not here. That's a, that's a possibility. Yeah, that's a real possibility, this or that. Uh, but um, the point is, just 
you know, stay here, be present. And whatever the events are in this present moment, uh, now you can deal with it. So you say, well, that event will get here. Yeah, it's, that's not exactly how that occurs, but it kind of looks that way or could look that way. And, uh, but the best way to be prepared for that is to be really present here and sane and get some confidence that you know that you can remain here. Yeah. You don't have to be afraid of the next thing that's gonna come leaping out at you. Besides yeah. that, uh, there's about as many good things <laughs> like this as there are bad. So, uh, so as the farmer said, well, who can say? And uh, also these things keep turning. Something that looks good as it arrives, turns out, well, that wasn't really so good, but I, and then there's something good that comes out of that. And, uh, and vice versa, goes in both directions or all directions. So it, it just kind of learn what to keep your mind on. And it doesn't mean to, to shut out stuff again, to, just not to blind yourself to anything. Um, but it's not here and uh, not now. Okay. And, uh, but here's where you are and this is where you can do something. And that's really has to do with your mind right now. Just take care of it. Yeah. I'm in this, I'm in the same situation you're in in regards to these questions. And I don't fret about it at all, but I'm fully aware of the twists and turns and things that can happen at least pretty aware. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff yeah. uh, politically or whatever that I'm, I don't, I'm not a, savvy to all everything that's occurring but i'm i'm quite aware of what's going on and i don't worry about it now it not that doesn't really help you but just want to let you know that it is possible <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it sounds it's it's simple but not easy there you go yeah you might not yeah and it's actually even easy once we are willing to give up a few things that have to like, do with there our, like our own ego, our own mind, our own uh, wish to have things go a certain way and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't I don't. Not only do I not wish for things like that anymore. I mean, I really I see that in itself as as very undesirable to live by what I want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's yeah. very, uh, so obvious to me that this is a way to live a miserable life. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that, is that well, it, Mike? well, yeah, that's it. Um, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. So, Bruce. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Bruce. So, um, you know, it, as a microcosm of the overall situation, you know, I work at a clinic and people are. Um, with the pandemic and everything that's going on and all these quick changes that are coming up and having to adapt rapidly, people are worn out. We've had high turnover, people leaving at various levels, nurses, um, uh, medical assistants, just people being stretched to their yeah. limit. And, um, and then I feel tired too. And I feel like, gosh, how long can I keep this up and things like that. But I'm trying to drop, um, my expectations of the situation and live in the now and my what ifs and just do my best and live with that, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, um, and so I'm trying to, you know, and it's even tough because it'd be much easier if, you know, we could meet in person and have sit together and all of these things. And when it feels like we're all the most vulnerable in these situation, we can't even be together, it's tough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is tough, you know. And I wish we could all be together too, or at least those of us uh, nearby here. But it's also great to have uh, met so many of you now that are that are not here, but we can still meet anyway. And we'll probably hang on to some aspect of this if uh, the COVID situation changes. But uh, but we're all feeling this, you know, uh, Bruce. We're all in this together, really. And uh, uh, but I but I hear you. And, um, and I have a lot of um, uh, you know, respect for, for those of you who are you know, working in the medical uh, field there, doing the various things that you do and the sacrifices you must make and the, the time you must put in and stuff like this. So thank you. Yeah. 
Well, I, well thanks. I mean, and uh, I'm at a humble position there, but I help make that clinic flow and I do help people. And most of the time they're pleased with my work. Sometimes they're angry because I can't give them all they want. And I wish I could. Yeah. Well, this is, this is all things will go, uh, no matter what. Uh, remember the farmer again. And, uh, you know, things just kind of shift and change. And people might react in various ways uh, to you and that sort of thing. For each of us, if you just, just do your best and, you know, stay here, stay present, take care of you know, things as they're coming up now in this moment. And uh, at least you won't have anything to, to uh, second guess, you know, yourself about and that sort of thing. You know, as you, if you could have done things better, yeah, maybe, but you didn't know it at the time, that sort of thing. So be easy on yourself, even if maybe some other people aren't. But um, um, now that's the other thing too, in, in learning to be present and taking care of each moment in this present moment, you won't have to, uh, you know, endure the kinds of uh, sufferings that we'll heap on ourselves for you know, feeling guilty or whatever. Uh, because we didn't do such and such or whatever. Well, maybe at the time you didn't know, but also maybe at the time you're just totally exhausted, you know, and, uh, you know, any number of things are there. Uh, sometimes too, yeah, maybe you were kind of lax in this point. You know, I, I see this myself too. And then I realized, yeah, you know, I could have done better there. But I don't beat myself up for it. I just realize that that's the case. And next time, I, I hope I do a little better than that. Uh, you know, but th this is this is how we have to go. Um, we can, if we can live this way, <laughs> and be forgiving of each other and also forgiving of ourselves and all of that, then we don't have to uh, react so deeply and personally and that sort of thing when uh, the various slings and arrows come our way. So, so that sounds very naturally like the practice of vow and admission, you know, um, and yeah, uh, yeah. I think that it sounds to me like there's a power of non-judgment of ourselves and others, and then we can really learn and maybe yeah. do things better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, and another way of looking at this whole thing about judgment, you have to realize that that is all abstraction, the judgment. You have to have put things into a, some kind of a conceptual form and then attach some kind of weight, good, bad, you know, right, wrong, this sort of thing to it. This is becoming very abstract, and we're we're allowing that to um, kind of propel us around the room and, and through life and this sort of thing, <laughs> reacting to this or that and one thing, when in fact it's all kind of insane. It's it's not we're not reacting to what is really uh, taking place, and uh, uh, but to the extent that we can really be present in this moment, we will be here, uh, where. Well, engaged in the life that we're actually living out. And this doesn't entail with it uh, all of these other kinds of things that otherwise might uh, crush us or disturb us or bother us or drive us or, you know, make us fearful and stuff like that, angry. So I see. And, and the one thing I'm trying to work on is uh, there was a teaching once that Norm had given about Thich Nhat Hanh's mentioning of the sutra of the buddha the power to see a footstep and see who made that step and whether they had a burden of on them and i realized a few years ago about that how i go into work some less and less though with that baggage of feeling the burden of what shall befall me today and dwelling on the future and regrets and all that and and just really perhaps trying to learn to let go and not have leave that imprint on the world and just go trying to be as open and willing and honest as I can with the world and do my best and and just keep flowing just let it just let it keep unfolding yeah, again it's just you know bring your back yourself back to this moment and uh, realize in this moment you know what you're doing and there's times it will start weighing out in the in this uh, these abstractions of our mind as humans we have this powerful ability to abstract our experience and to um, anticipate things that aren't occurring now, but yeah, possibly might occur with some measure of coincidence or, or whatever else, uh, you know, but um, there's nothing we can do about that's total abstraction and that's not uh, the actual uh, life that we're living out. 
it's one thing to be aware of possibilities. That's one thing. But to start uh, uh, living out of, of fear and anxiety or, or drivenness uh, as a result of those kinds of things, that's not particularly helpful. All the while we're doing that, we're not here in this moment that's actually being lived out. So uh, to the extent that we can bring ourselves more to this moment, you know, that's what we need to do. You'll be more settled, you'll be more sane, more calm, more, you'll see more, uh, you know, and, and you make wiser decisions and, and all of these kinds of things if you're just here. <laughs> so it's just a lot, it's a lot easier in the end, though it, uh, it might be difficult at first to remind ourselves in when we're tossed away by this or that, uh, to realize what we're doing and then just to come back. It's hard, it's hard just to drop the things that might be gripping us at the moment. But little by little, you know, we can start to recognize what we're doing and, uh, and stop being quite as uh, crazy as we might otherwise be. But by that, I mean just being not here in the moment, but lost in some abstraction of our mind. Well, I've, I've noticed um, I've been able to do that better than I thought through all of this and I keep adapting and moving forward and, and um, I can watch my mind and let that stuff go and it might feel gripping, but uh, a lot of times it just isn't. It just, before I know it, it's past. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Bruce. We have some more questions yeah. here too. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, Jed. Yes, thank you. And I also want to thank Bruce too. Uh, mm -hmm. front well, there you are. Okay, I was trying to find you on my <laughs> screen here. <laughs> so yeah, just appreciation to everybody here. Yeah. Uh, just uh, just wondered about um, something we've been hearing a lot about division in America. I think a lot of us have experience of feeling maybe strained relationships with different people, family, friends, so forth. And it seems like you kind of addressed this at the end of your comments in the last question, but just wondered what you thought of that. And then also this impulse that maybe we feel um, strongly about a certain issue, but it almost seems like no matter what we say, we're just causing more conflict by bringing it up. So it can be a challenge, I think, to try to address the things that we feel about, but then also be not judgmental at the same time. Um, so, and my mic's a little messed up, so I think I'll just hand it off to you uh, to answer it here. So, okay. Well, in in dealing with uh, yeah other people, uh, that sort of thing, who who might have uh, strong uh, opinions uh, that differ from yours. Uh, uh, and yeah, our tendency might be in there to get in there and to try to straighten them out and show them how wrong they are and, and this sort of thing. Uh, that's really not very helpful. Um, and uh, uh, it might be better to just take them on the ground that they're standing. Just get on that ground yourself and uh, try to put yourself uh, in, in their position. Just try to best understand it as you can. And then perhaps ask questions of them, you know, like, so you say, well, you're looking at, I can see why, you know, you're looking at this, but then, then maybe you have a question about it, but you, we can do this without challenging them or without, um, uh, what would be the word, um, you know, oh, I don't want to say attacking, but, but, you know, without, uh, um, you know, and, and diving in there and wanting to show how wrong they are and how crazy they are and stupid they are and that sort of thing. And, uh, uh, and how angry it makes me, you know, when you say stuff like this, that, the things like that aren't very helpful. But if you get there uh, and put yourself as best you can, maybe it's next to impossible sometimes perhaps, but <laughs> get into their space a little bit, see where they are. And uh, there might even be a few points in there that, uh, that resonate with you, that make sense to you and that sort of thing. And maybe from there, you can then ask, you know, some questions and, to help them think about uh, about the position they've taken, does it make sense? I don't. I don't quite. Without attacking, you can say, "Well, I don't quite understand." You know, if you did that, wouldn't wouldn't this occur? You know, let them, uh, you know, think about it. And that way, you know, you you make very thin or possibly even remove 
but I wouldn't expect that necessarily, but to make the barrier between you much thinner. So at least you can talk through the veil there rather than uh, you know trying to <laughs> crash through a brick wall or something, you know. So I, I think that's, uh, you know, an approach that we can uh, take. But again, it's sort of like I mentioned before about just kind of giving up your own kind of stuff. And, um, uh, and you can give it up without really maybe, um, uh, well, it's best if you don't really uh, hold too much in the first place. <laughs> so, and then it's easier uh, maybe to, to, to talk to others. Of course, in this moment, yeah, you can see that, well, this alternative is, would be better than that. That's another thing too, I, I was thinking I could have talked about today too, is, and I did talk about this, I have talked about this before, but uh, from the from the point of view of the, it's not really a point of view though, of the awakened, um, yeah, they're not coming from some, some particular point of view, but are always holding in their mind the totality. And just see this from the standpoint of, uh, of wholeness and totality. And so the, then they won't be coming from, from some particular view, to the uh, particular view, but to the extent that we can do that, uh, we can get outside the tight confines of our own little space here and what we think is right and good and this must be so and all that. It'd be much easier to uh, to then talk with uh, people that we might otherwise be really at odds with and angry about and, and stuff like this. As for the belligerent person who you can't reach or engage in some way, uh, something if you run into something like that and that can occur as well, uh, that might be best just to avoid <laughs> getting getting caught up and uh, just be polite and exchange in, in ways like that, but you don't necessarily have to. Uh, I know in my own family, uh, the family at large, uh, we say like at the old cliche thing here, we all get together for Thanksgiving, that kind of stuff, when you meet uh, relatives that you don't see too regularly. And uh, uh, yeah, well, when we, whenever we have these kinds of engagements in, in my larger family, uh, and we're not going to meet this year at Thanksgiving now, so, <laughs> but uh, just because of the COVID thing, as many people probably aren't, but anyway, uh, it, it's sort of an unwritten rule. I don't recall it has ever been spelled out, but we basically, we, we don't talk politics. We know the positions that different people have and stuff like that, and so it, uh, it almost never comes up unless uh, everybody left in the room happens to be of a of the same kind of persuasion or something like that. But that's a, it's a safe way so that we can have at least, uh, cause we're all, we love each other. We're all, it's all family, that sort of thing. And so we can behave a little bit better toward each other. Uh, particularly at occasions like that. Um, it just works a little better. Um, but otherwise, um, if you are on a one-on-one, one-to-one, -one, that sort of thing with somebody, um, just see if you can get into their space a bit and talk, talk from there. Even from your own point of view, I mean, you can do it as long as you don't use yours as a sledgehammer to go after them. <laughs> so I don't know, did I answer you there, Jed, or not? Yeah, yeah, very much. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Yasin. Oh, hello. Um, hi, Yasin. I just. Hi, hi. Uh, I would just have a question on if you can maybe help um, help me, like or help us, like understand, like Dogen's Uji, you know, being time. Uji, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Like, uh, if if you would have like a maybe like some pointers or like some some ways of like getting the, the gestalt or something, you know. <laughs> well, I, or, how, I think... or maybe how how has your understanding changed, like decades after decades of like you know what 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 this stuff was all about. Oh, and Uji. Yeah, well, that's a uh, um, that would be very difficult to to uh, lay that out here. But mm -hmm. Uji is being time, uh, tr general translation into English, an essay by uh, uh, Dogen. Um, but he gets into some very uh, subtle things there. Uh, I don't know if I can say too much right here to a general audience or to many people who haven't uh, read this yet or encountered it. But uh, it is a fascinating uh, thing. If you want to bring that up with me sometime, uh, if we have a uh, one-on-one -on -one with Doko-san, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, nothing comes to mind. I, I almost mentioned in the uh, Bouchot that we had, 
of the Bouchot class. Some of you were in the Bouchot class. And uh, I think you can still tune in and get it, get it on, uh, on, on our website. Oh, um, okay, okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but, and, and, but there were several places and toward the end of Bouchot there too, there's uh, times when Dogen is touching on things that remind me of Uji anyway. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so, uh, yeah. so- and I was going to make some reference to that here and there, but I never uh, got around to that. Uh, so, so, so for example, when he says, you know, climbing the mountain and crossing the rivers and like, you know, arriving in a Vermilion Palace or something, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and he's saying that like, so it's like an analogy, like, okay, before he was crossing the river and now, after that he was climbing the mountains and now he's in the Vermilion Palace, which means like he's awakened or something. But in reality, he's saying that the rivers and like the mountains are not in the past or something, they are there yeah, with yeah. him or something. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's a kind of like the past is still present, like shaping, structuring this moment. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, well, climbing the mountain. Like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and climbing the mountain is now, and uh, you know, crossing the river, you know, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, so whatever it, it is right now, it is uh, you know, talking to you, and uh, uh, that's what this uh, this hour is. That's what this time is, and. Um, uh, it is mani- manifesting in just this way here and now. And uh, yeah, so that's uh, one of the points that Dogen was bringing us back to, you know, just to notice that <laughs> this, we tend to see ourselves in, situated in a place. Uh, maybe we even see ourselves somehow situated in, in, in a time or something like that. But these are not like two different things that happen to be uh, bound together. It, this is just what it is. It is, this being is as much uh, time as, as it is uh, uh, what we might think of as being. And being, oh boy, <laughs> being is a tricky word though. And I would have quite a bit to say about that too, but I, it, this really isn't quite the place to- uh, Sure, sure, no problem, yeah. no problem. Yeah. But if you wanna bring it up with me sometime and some specific things that you've read, uh, please do. Sure, sure. But, but I had a question on, conti- on continuity oh, oh, yeah. as well, but I had a question oh, oh. On, continu- on continuity as well. If you could point at like the illusion of continuity, but if you don't have time, it's fine. Oh, that yeah. Well, that's yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a little uh, uh, simpler to dive into there. <laughs> but um, yeah, this is um, uh, basically this is what the Buddha was referring to. You're talking about continuity, right? Yes, continuity. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it appears like the object of consciousness appears like it is. Uh, uh, continuing from one moment uh, to the next. And uh, this is what the Buddha referred to as um, uh, rebirth consciousness. And, uh, mm-hmm. uh, and which has been taken by many people mistakenly <laughs> that he's talking about something like reincarnation. And that it is, isn't it at all. That conflicts with pretty much everything else the Buddha uh, taught. And there's some real problems with that, but that was the culture in which this was spoken and it came filtering through. And uh, so it gets interpreted that way quite a bit, but actually what he's talking about is this, this, uh, yeah, this illusion of continuity, but it is basically that the way uh, uh, consciousness functions is that this moment looks very much like what just preceded it. And uh, with that, then the, the various objects that we take to be separate and real and distinct and persisting, uh, through time and that sort of thing, permanent, or at least in a limited way, uh, we see those things as continuing uh, through time. And so that gives a, a kind of a sense of, uh, of continuity uh, of, of the actual object. The continuity is just simply that this moment looks very much like what just preceded it. And it's not, it's not of thingness, it's not of, um, you know, and, and actually this feeds then back into what Dogen is talking about. And again, <laughs> there's some uh, real problems in how we might want to interpret or, or, or it's how we can easily misinterpret uh, you know, what's being pointed out here. Because we'll, we will normally come at these kinds of teachings and things with our own, um, we're, we're, we're probably not even really fully aware of our own, um, what can I say, Bi- not biases, but- uh, Preconceptions? Well, there are yeah our own our own impressions and and uh, ideas about how things are. We we see continuity. We, we see permanence where there just simply isn't any and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So when when these uh, kind of writings, these teachers are talking in the way that they wrote in the way that they did, 
uh, it's very easy for us to misinterpret what they're saying uh, because we sim simply don't see it in the way that they're speaking of. Uh, there's, they're coming at it from one who's awake to what's actually unfolding here. And what we don't have, we don't actually have anything that's persisting from moment to moment. And, um, uh, and so as long as we continue to, we have a deep belief in that, we don't even question it. And now when we read these kinds of writings, being time or, or uh, Buddha's teaching on uh, uh, rebirth consciousness and this sort of thing, we will misinterpret you know, what it is that they're pointing out. So that's probably about all I can say uh, right now. But these are quite uh, profound and interesting questions you see. <laughs> okay. <no reason. laughs> I wish I could give if I devoted a talk to this on a Sunday morning or something, maybe that would be one thing. But there's quite a bit here, and it's hard to uh, really, uh, you know, pick out much that that uh, will will make uh, uh, a lot of a lot of sense without a lot of background behind it. So, be and only because it counters uh, so much of our normal everyday understanding of what our experience is. But thank you. These are very good questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Shirley. Hi, Steve. I'm actually, this yeah. is actually for Steve Matuzak. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Shirley. Yeah, um, I can't raise my hand, so I, I asked Shirley to raise her hand instead. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we have a question in the chat from Eileen. Okay, I mean, she writes, we do vote. So obviously we have a preference. We want a particular outcome to occur when we vote. So how can we exhibit no outward concern for that outcome and not want that outcome to materialize once we do make the choice and vote? Yeah, that was a very good question. Um, uh, and yeah, it's one thing to have, uh, you might want to have a particular outcome uh, and, and you have particular things in mind that you want to bring about or, or to take place and that sort of thing. So you vote uh, this way as opposed to that and that sort of thing. Uh, but for, uh, you know, and so it doesn't, I mean, that's very normal, natural for us and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it, other than we, we can easily be attached to the, the outcome that we want and that sort of thing. And now that's gonna cause uh, trouble but the way the awakened, you know, the enlightened would uh, approach this, I mean, I voted <laughs> and I, I wanted a particular, well, it's not that I wanted a particular outcome necessarily, or, but it, it boils down to that. It's gonna be either this candidate or that candidate is what it, you know, it really comes down to, at least here in the United States, is you, we usually end up with just two. And, uh, but th this is what the awakened are looking for has nothing to do with that candidate or this candidate has nothing to do with that party or this party or a third party. Uh, they're not looking at things like this at all. What they're looking at is what is uh, of the wholesome uh, as opposed to, um, uh, well, the fractured and the divided. And, uh, uh, and so the voting would, would just go in that direction and uh, you know, I don't identify with with either party. Uh, and uh, uh, I can tell you that I tend to vote uh, in one direction. It, it might look that way if you looked at my record, though. It's, I don't always vote for the same party. And um, uh, and I voted for uh, third parties at times. I, I don't want to get into so much about that. But the 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 thing that I'm looking for, and it's been this way. You now with me for a long time. <laughs> I don't jump on the party bandwagon about this or that or this issue or that issue, but looking at it in a very general way, what uh, of these choices that are presented to us here, what would be, uh, what appears to be more conducive to, you know, just a settledness of the, uh, you know, and a bringing together of, of the society and not causing a lot of friction and dissension and fighting and division and, and that sort of thing. What is what less warlike and stuff of that sort? What, what is more uh, concerned with uh, the health and welfare of, of the many? And, and you know, so it's these kinds of uh, issues um, uh, you know, that would be, but, but it's not even like, it's not even a list of issues. It's just, a, you can see this very clearly 
this one is going to lead to a lot of fracturing and division. Yeah, I might want that to be the thing that we're going to go. But uh, notice what you're doing there. And the awakened aren't hanging on to one thing or another in that way. It's just a, and so it really comes down to what the Buddha said when he summed up the whole thing in a simple verse, which I've given you many times, where he said, do what is wholesome, avoid what is unwholesome, purify your own mind. That is, don't, don't be grasping after this issue or that issue, this thing or that thing. And then he, and then he just summed it up. He said, this is the teaching of the awakened. This is what the awakened teach. So do what is wholesome, you know, to move in that direction, that things that are conducive to that, to us awakening to that, opening up to that, listening to that, acting out of that understanding. Avoid what is unwholesome, what is not of the whole, what is of the fractured uh, view of this or that. Avoid that go toward the one that is whole and so that's um um that's the way to vote <laughs> and um or at least that's how the awakened you know that's what the concern would be so it isn't a matter then that yes well i want this or i want that if you're looking at it in terms of wholesome you can, i could say yes i want the wholesome i'm talking about my own heart here yeah but it isn't like that's a thing or something of that sort I'm not going to fight for it. I'm not going to, what, jump on somebody else because they're going for the fractured or <laughs> that doesn't, that's, no, no, I'm fractured, you know. So it's just acting in this way, in a kind of a quiet and dispassionate way, sort of, but just move in that direction. So I remember once uh, talking with a, an expert at checkers and um, I was so, so at checkers. I was better at checkers than chess, that's for sure. But uh, but anyway, but this this guy really knew his, how to play checkers, and he had one rule, <laughs> and the rule was to always do, here's here's the secret to playing checkers, you always move toward the center to the center of the board, that's that was his rule. So wherever you are, is if you can move toward the center of the board, and uh, and I, I guess if you just consider, I, I I couldn't make it work so consistently that I thought ah this is truly the secret, but that's what he said. But anyway, this is sort of the, the, the same sort of thing. It's just the one rule here. And I wouldn't call it a rule, but just look at this and move toward that which is of the whole that, that will reduce the contention and the fighting and the, uh, uh, the division and all of that and will embrace uh, that which, of is, which is of the whole and that embraces us all. Um, and that's that's really it. And, uh, and and so it isn't like my personal preference for this. I'm not thinking about any personal kind of thing or or any particular issue or that sort of thing. I'm just looking for that choice that we have here that has that feeling, that taste, that that quality about it. And then I vote in that direction. That's all. And I think, uh, you know, and it has nothing to do with, uh, you know, well, yes, but I want a particular outcome. Well, not a, no, I don't want it. <laughs> I, 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 unless you could say that particular outcome is for all, all, all people to awaken. Yeah, that would be, but how do you do that? I don't know. But we can move toward the whole. And I think uh, that's the way to look at it. And then when it comes to any other particular issue or situation that you're in, you can still remember that. Don't lose track of that. Don't lose sight of that. This is where the awakening uh, are coming from, so to speak, even though it's not really coming from a place at all, because it is out of the hole. Okay, well, I hope that uh, uh, that was Elaine, uh, or no, uh, Eileen, or the Elaine, okay. So, th uh, well, thank you for the question. I hope that uh, helps you. Um, and I guess we have used up the hour here just about, so. And I don't see any blue. Did, was there any more there, Steve? Or? No, that's it. Eileen, yeah. Thank, thank you, Eileen. Okay. And uh, all right. Well, thank you so much.